Tonight we're going to talk about where are we going. We talked about the mission being to catalyze DMM everywhere. Now that is a big vision because there's a lot of there everywhere. To get this done, the Lord's put it on our heart that we need to pursue three basic themes. One, to have a global scope for DMM, to have a global voice in DMM, and to have global lift. That means innovation surrounding DMM. So we're gonna talk about that tonight. The global scope, everywhere means geographical regions. Right now, we have DMM activities going in North Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in South Asia, which is dominated by India, Southeast Asia, which is Indonesia, Vietnam, Cambodia, and so forth, Eurasia, and right here in North America. Tomorrow, by God's grace, we expect to be in the Far East, in the Middle East, in Europe, the Latin world, and the island nations. That's everywhere. Now, Antarctica, well, we haven't put that on the list yet. We'll see how that goes. But everywhere is not just geography. It's also the urban arena. Everywhere is more than just the political boundaries that define countries. It's also the concentrated populations. Right now, more than half the world's population is in cities and the trend is exponentially up. That is where things are going. And guess where missions is not? It's not in the urban arena. Now there's lots of missionary work to, or ministry work to help the hurting. You know, feed the homeless or care for addicts or whatever. But you're not seeing the kind of missionary intentionality in the strategy and in the action that the urban arena warrants. And it's already out in front of us and if we don't pay attention to that, we're gonna be waving at the train that left the station. This is the frontier of missions in our day. We have to be serious about the urban arena. That's part of everywhere. Everywhere is also affinity groups. Now these range all the way from the unreached people groups in the way out back of somewhere, all the way down to the invisible masses that live right in the shadow of an existing church. And that's not saying that church is bad. But there's a very high percentage of things that are established that are neither relevant nor attractive to the folks within arm's reach. So they're effectively outside of the scope. We have to pay attention to affinity as one of the dominant factors of the future of missions, because it's not gonna be geography, and it's not gonna be people groups as we've understood them. It's gonna be, what is the glue that holds people together sufficiently to give them an identity that warrants a strategy to make movements happen in them? That's part of the future, and that's part of everywhere. And everywhere also has to include the forgotten segments of highly damaged people. People like prisoners, like you saw in the movie. Like gang members, like prostitutes, like street kids. They're not going to fit in the existing established ministries, not in any reasonable percentage. And the numbers are incredibly large, and the problems are incredibly complex. We believe you have to not only help those hurting people, you need to see things catalyzed among them that can actually multiply. All of that is everywhere, and we believe God wants things that can reproduce without you in all those expressions of everywhere. So when we say the mission of the family that wants to move together is disciple-making movements everywhere, that's what we're talking about, because everywhere means everyone, no matter who they are and where they are. How's it gonna be possible to make this true? Great vision, every person, everywhere, but what makes it possible? The only way to get where we wanna go is to catalyze. That means that you don't have to do it yourself, you have to make sure it's happening. And those are very different. The picture in the scripture is what I alluded to yesterday. It's about leaven, because Jesus said the kingdom of God is like leaven. Then he went on to describe it. It's like a woman who put the leaven in three measures of flour until it was all changed. Then he moved on, and he left his disciples to ponder 
That's the kingdom of God. Well, I did a little homework and found out something I didn't know. 1 Corinthians says, a little bit of leaven changes everything. So I went back and found out what that word measure means. Three measures that Jesus said that woman had. Round numbers, it's 50 pounds. She had 150 pounds of flour that a little leaven was going to change. You think about that as we characterize you as a catalyst and a coach. Can you have that kind of catalytic influence that is so incredibly disproportional that it can change forever that kind of magnitude amongst the lost? Well, that's the vision that God said. He said, that's the kingdom. And we're all about the kingdom business because we're all ambassadors for the king. So we need to get into our minds that he said, this is my idea. A little bit of this is going to change everything, assuming it's the real stuff and assuming it's well distributed, because that's what that lady did. Water, flour, dough, put the yeast in and squish it all around. So it gets everywhere into everything. Now, what's the leaven that we're going to use? We're going to get the next generation of local leaders to have the mindset that this is possible and that God assigned them to do it, not us to do it for them, not even us to do it with them, but us to help them do it for themselves and get others to do the same. We're going to give them that mindset. We're going to give them the tools to make it possible. We're going to give them the coaching to both get them going forward and course correct when they drift. And then we're going to give them the encouragement because the enemy is all in against this. This represents the end for him. We're also going to empower existing ministries. There's such a challenge right now. What do you do with stuff that already is? It has its own culture. It has its own inertia. It has all of its, its uh, def definition already in place. And we're saying, hey, there's a new paradigm. And that new paradigm represents the end game goal. But it's very difficult to get things that exist today and came out of a certain genesis to actually see something different and accomplish the change to make it true in their circle of influence. But it's not impossible. And right here in North America, we need to believe that. It is not impossible. In our experience, as limited as it is, right now, in round numbers, there's 900 indigenous organizations as partners. 900. They're scattered all over everywhere. They're not in any way homogeneous. They're all different. They all had a different starting point. They had a different focus. They have different staff, different resources. All that stuff is different. So 900 is a reasonable sample of diversity. I asked the field team, would it be true to say that when you engage them, they did not have reproductive results, and now they do? And they said, yeah, there may be some exceptions. 900's a lot. But generally speaking, they said, yeah, that's the case. They did not have reproductive results, and now they do. Proving that it's true. Proving that if it can happen there, and amidst all that diversity, it can happen here. Now, I'm not saying that's simple. There's a huge number of challenges that go into that. But I don't think God wants to just blow it up and wipe it off. So, therefore, if it needs to have different characteristics to get different outcomes, then he's going to give his people who kept, catch the concepts the ability to help bring the change that's necessary so that those existing ministries can fulfill the destiny that God designed for them. And we have to believe that. Because if we don't, we're basically taking a huge piece of the workforce out of the equation. We also need to incubate new things. Help them birth. The sovereign God has placed the leaders all around in the midst of the lost that he expects to take ownership of that arena. And he expects them to be able to be the catalyst for change. We have to help it happen. There's an awful lot of critical mass that's necessary before they can actually fulfill that challenge. Well, we've had a chance to experience it to some degree. All of you in some degree. Others need it. We have to help be the midwife to birth something 
that does not bear our name, is not tethered to us, is not dependent on us, but has every advantage to make the change that we desire to be all around the earth because DMM needs to be everywhere. And we need to make sure that our DNA is to replicate and not just multiply. We touched on that yesterday. The distinction, multiply the numbers get bigger. And there's nothing not to like about that as long as it keeps going and keeps its quality. And that's where replication comes in. Multiplication, the numbers get bigger and replication, the process goes with it. Because if that process doesn't change or transfer, then you're gonna be able to draw a circle around the impact and it may be good, but effectively it's gonna be an island in an ocean. And even if it's a very nice island, it's still very limited relative to the problem. We have to help get the DNA of replication deep in the soul. And it has to start day one. That's why we went through the Shema yesterday. God's template, every day, in every way, reinforce the DNA. Because that's all you have to depend on when you're out of the picture. If you want to have a legacy for the kingdom, that can aspire to a thousand generations after you're long dead and gone. It's gonna be because you had the insight to see and the fierce resolve to make sure that that passion to replicate was passed on to whoever comes after you and they understand it's job one right there. Nothing else is more important than to make sure that they pass it on to whoever they influence. You know, just as an illustration, we all know about the feeding of the 5,000, right? <coughs> Jesus took that little kid's five loaves and two fish, and he multiplied it, and everybody got fed. And nobody could replicate the process. Now, the multiplication was great, but it had an end to it because nobody else could do it. We want to have replication built in to the strategy and the training and the measurement so that everyone has the process that can repeat the outcomes. And that replication has to surround, be surrounded on discovery-focused, obedience-based, reproductive system. That's what we want to see replicate. There's all kinds of things you can add to it to enhance it, but that's the center line. And, and here's a headline that I'll offer to you. You cannot capitalize the Great Commission. You can only catalyze it. You think about the magnitude of the undone task, something like six billion people scattered all over the place, very dispersed, very diverse, and very difficult, because if it was easy, it would be done. Against that, if you try to say, we can fight this with money, we can get enough money and enough equipment and enough buildings and enough branding and enough marketing and all that stuff to get that job done. Well, you're smoking dope. <laughs> you cannot get there from here. And yet if you take a look at what we're trying to do and say, okay, what is the engine we say are driving us to the conclusion of God's assignment? It kind of looks like budgets and buildings and professionals and technology and so forth. Those are great. They're great tools. But they cannot get the job done if you have to capitalize everything that's required. And Jesus never had that idea. He talked to guys who had nothing and said, hey, I want you to go everywhere. I want you to win everyone. And you're not going to get anything to do it with. Go get them. And they must have thought that was nuts. <laughs> then the power of the Holy Spirit came on them and they chose to obey and they invited other people to do the same. And guess what? All of a sudden you see this stuff is in Herod's household, Jewish royalty. Then it's in Caesar's household, the epicenter of the empire. Then it's in the Praetorian Guard, military elite. Then it's in crazy places like Ephesus and Corinth that are filled with idols and want nothing to do with this but they have people who sell goods and trade and go back and forth. Then you hear something like it's in all Asia. Then you hear the world's upside down. None of that happened because of enormous capital that God injected into the system. A global voice 
That's all about global scope. A global voice, what does it mean? It means speaking into the conversation about what it actually takes to get the Great Commission done and the role of movements within that. This is a conversation. Nobody has the last word. But in that conversation, I believe within the family, around the table, as we search for a solution and for highest and best, it's okay to be politely provocative. That means we're gonna stop denying what is the cold, hard reality if we can't get there from here. Because if you always do what you always did, you'll always have. <laughs> That's the way it works, right? I stole a quote from a guy. He said, the system in place is perfectly designed for the results you're getting. <laughs> What's the obvious implication? You don't like the results? You gotta change the system. And no fair dropping the standard down so that you can trip over it. That's not the idea. That happens over and over again. We see what we got and we decide to call it success instead of saying, this is what God wants and what do we have to do to get there? That problem is gonna be solved in a global conversation that gets clarity on what the problem actually is and what it's gonna to take to get it done. And in this global voice, I'm gonna give you 10 things that I believe we must proclaim. And I think we need to proclaim it with one voice. Now, Roy would say, I'm in love with Liz. And my wife would say, I need to find a program where they can break this addiction. But <laughs> you're gonna get 10. <laughs> I've got dual addictions. I've got lists and I've got alliteration. So it's like being bipolar or something. So here we go, there's 10 of them. We need to proclaim that intercession is essential. Full stop. That's where everything starts. Without that, it doesn't matter how slick the system is. Jesus said, and everybody can quote it, apart from me, you can do nothing, John 15, five. Everybody knows that, everybody says they believe it, but actions speak louder than words. If we really did believe it, what would we do about it? Because you know how you measure what you value? Where you can really figure it out? Well, you find it in your calendar and your checkbook. <laughs> what, what kind of effort and intentionality is going into intercession? If we believe that's the baseline, apart from me, you can do nothing. If we actually believe, we're not wrestling with flesh and blood. It's not about all the obstacles right down here. It's principalities and powers and the spiritual forces of wicked in the heavenly places. If we believe that, why don't we act like it? And the intercession that is currently targeted to North America is minuscule. That has to change but it has to be also part of a global move to put first things first. In the new generation's family, by God's grace and an awful lot of effort, mostly by the field folks, there's over 100,000 dedicated intercessors. Now, I'm not trying to impress you with a big number, I'm trying to say that's the level of commitment of how important this is. That takes time, it takes money, it takes leadership, but you can't get there without it. We're gonna proclaim that intercession is essential. We're also gonna proclaim that discovery is a lifestyle for everyone. A lifestyle, not a program, not an add-on. It's that everyone who claims the name will put their nose in the book and have the question in their heart, what does it mean to me that you would have me do and be ready with the answer to say, I will obey and get others to do the same. Now that is not rocket science. It is spiritual nuclear power and pretty much it's on the sidelines. That day has to be done. It starts with proclaiming everybody. You're not borrowing your daily bread from somebody who speaks eloquently and you think knows more than you. There's a role for teachers. We're not anti-teaching in any way, shape or form. God gave the gift of teaching. It provides illumination for what is not on the surface and it allows you to see how to apply it to make a difference. That is part of God's gift mix. It should never be out of the equation, but it shall not ever replace 
the reality that each of us and everybody we influence should be directly relating to God to discover his will in his word and choose to obey. We're going to proclaim that discovery is a lifestyle for all. We're going to proclaim that knowledge without obedience is lifeless. And you don't have to look any farther than the Pharisees to know that this is true. Steeped in knowledge and yet lifeless and worse than dead, they're counterproductive. They're not neutral. They're negative. Now, is knowledge bad? Of course not. How can you act on what you don't know? The point is, is it the gateway to the obedience that aligns you with the will of God, or is it an end in itself? And knowledge can never be an end in itself. And we need to proclaim that knowledge in isolation is lifeless. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey. He didn't say, raise your hand if you believe what I say. It is not about knowledge. It's about obedience. And everybody knows actions speak louder than words. That has to be where the rubber hits the road. We're going to proclaim that disciple making is for everyone. Here's the satanic lie that has been bought wholesale around the world for generations. Total theological nonsense. Well, making disciples is on a list of spiritual gifts that I didn't get. Therefore, I can park my backside on the bench guilt-free. That's a lie. It's obvious to anybody who investigates with an open mind. And yet, that's the prevailing attitude. They don't use the words, but that's what they act like. It's not my job. Colossians 1 verse 6 says the gospel is constantly bearing fruit and an increasing. Is that your experience? Is that what you're observing? Is that normative? That it's constantly bearing fruit and increasing? The answer is no. So here's the question. Why? Because Satan has sold the lie that it's not your job. And the leadership has encountered that sufficiently to make sure that everybody understands that this is God's universal command. I would offer to you that there's three pillars on which the New Testament stands. To love God, love your neighbor, and make disciples who obey. That is universal, it is for everyone, and we leave it out at our peril. God broke my heart over this with what I call a pants down spanking that happened several decades ago, but I still feel the sting. <laughs> Where I looked in the mirror and effectively heard the Spirit of God say, what you've been doing is planting and harvesting seedless grapes. Oh, the fruit is real, but it's one generation and done. And you cannot get God's job done by planting and harvesting seedless grapes. And don't make the mistake that grapes with seeds are the end of the story. Those seeds have to be planted. They have to be watered. It has to be weeded around them and nurtured. There is a process that goes in this, but it starts with the reality of they have to be grapes with seeds or it's one generation and done. All right. We're also going to proclaim that ordinary people are the centerpiece of God's strategy. That is as, as it began and that's how it always will be. I'm a guy who's got 48 years of full-time ministry in an organized context. I believe that God is honored in that role. I don't feel like I missed his mark, but I also have come to understand that I am the complement to his core strategy. His core strategy is Joe and Sally Smith, the ordinary folks in the everyday walks of life. And my job is to help them be successful because they are his strategy and without them, we cannot win. First Corinthians 9.24, run to win. You cannot win without the ordinary people multiplying disciples in their natural network, full stop. Doesn't matter what else you add in the equation, you don't have that, you're not gonna win. So here's a thought for you. 
The purpose of evangelism is not just salvation. It's the first step in producing obedience-based reproducing disciples. If you look at it that way, you change your paradigm. Because if it's just about salvation, then you can come to a big stop. Drop your shoulders, take a breath, and sit down. We've checked the box, right? No. It's the beginning of the story, not the end of the story. They come to saving faith. What is the vision that they should be born with? That God will use you as part of his covenant he gave to Abraham to increase beyond you like the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. From one, God made that promise. And he repeated it to his son Isaac and then to Jacob. And basically was saying, keep sharing this vision all throughout the generations. Every time somebody comes to faith in Jesus Christ, they ought to be born with the vision of how God is going to use them in whatever circle of influence he plants them to continually be the catalyst, the leaven, that produces a chain reaction of other obedience-based reproductive disciples. Other means you are one. If that's the vision they're born with, they will start their journey in an entirely different direction. They won't be headed for the bench, they'll be headed for the field. We're going to proclaim that they are the centerpiece of God's strategy. The goal in an army, in a war that cannot be won without the soldiers changing side, is to recruit and release that army of ordinary people. We're going to proclaim that the workers are in the harvest. The workforce for the next harvest is in the fruit from the last harvest. Now, when Jesus said the harvest is ready, but the workers are few, that's been taken to mean go plead with folks far away to see if they'll come in this field and help with the harvest. That's not bad, but it's not the best strategy. The best strategy is that that harvest right there in the native soil is where those seeds will be replanted and they'll be harvested by the people who have every advantage. They are there, they are known, the culture, the language, the call, all that stuff. So it's not that the missionary from the outside is wrong, it just, it can't be the dominant strategy. We're gonna proclaim that the workers are in the harvest because no outside workforce could ever match the power of those who are from and within. We're gonna proclaim that good news must be felt and not heard. You know, when the gospel is only something you hear and you're hurting, it just doesn't feel like good news because you're so distracted with the stuff you're dealing with. When Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor are commands that have equal standing with God. He basically took away the argument of secular and social and said, the two are inseparably infused together. They're two wings of the bird and we're not going to have a discussion about, well, we provide this part and somebody else does that part. He didn't allow for that. He gave us the assignment to love our neighbor as an expression of loving God. Here's something to think about when you see hurting people. We don't meet their needs just so they will come to Jesus. We meet their needs because we have come to Jesus. And the motivation makes all the difference. The motive is the dividing line. It still may look like help, but if it's help as a byproduct of a love relationship with God, as his representative, because he loves them, you love them, and it's something they can feel and not just hear, then that motivation sanctifies it and it honors the Father. If it's a means to an end, or a check the box or a bolt on, it doesn't have the same effect. Now what, when people feel good news, they want to know who sent it. That happens over and over and over again.
People say, why? Why did you risk your life to bring us that food during COVID? And we had 135 or so who gave their life in helping hurting people. And tens of thousands came to Saving Faith because they understood the why behind that expression of love. God uses that in his economy. We're gonna proclaim that little fires are better than one great big one. You know what? I learned a lesson in a strange place. I learned that one big light in the center was not God's plan and purpose. And I learned that in Las Vegas. I was there a very long time ago with my girls in gymnastics. They had a national competition there, so we had to be in Las Vegas. And at night, as we were walking down the street, we came by this hotel. It's called the Luxor. It's in the shape of an Egyptian pyramid. And out of the peak of that thing was the world's biggest laser. And you could see it from Los Angeles all the way to Las Vegas on a clear night. I looked at that thing, and I said, one great big light in the center is not doing anything to drive the darkness out of the corners. And that's exactly why Jesus looked in the eyes of the guys and said, it's to your benefit I go away. They said, no, boss, it's not. I mean, you got a lot of good ideas, but you're a little off today. I mean, who's going to do the fish and bread thing? And who's going to deal with cranky Pharisees? Boss, I mean, you just got to hang tough, all right? No, he says, I'm out. And it's to your good. Why? because that light has to be scattered all over the place. And here's the reality of little fires versus one great big one. Every last one of those little bitty fires has infinite capacity to grow, as long as you teach people how to feed it. God wants that light everywhere. And to do that, you gotta have the fire starters who wanna get it going and make sure people know how to tend it but then get another one going across the road. We're going to proclaim that bigger is not better. And that's a lie. Doesn't mean bigger is bad. But the prevailing mindset is bigger is better, so everything needs to move that direction. But here's the reality. Big wows and little wins. That's the way it works. Big is very impressive but you can draw a circle around its impact. Little is what wins. We're gonna proclaim no loss left behind. <clears throat> Second Peter 3, 9, God does not want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. Everywhere means everyone, and we can be satisfied with nothing less. And here's number 10. We're gonna proclaim that the Great Commission can be done because the bottom line is people don't believe it people don't even understand it they don't try to understand it it's too overwhelming don't tell me about six billion people all around everywhere don't tell me that I'm supposed to be a part of that process it overwhelms me it leaves me hopeless and helpless how about if we energize them to say you know what it's right within reach and you can be part of of the culmination of history by just doing your part along with everybody else doing their part. And here's what it looks like. The formula to complete the Great Commission is this, it's simple. You won't have to write it down. Two plus two equals four. Why is that? Because they tell us there's two billion Christians in the world. If every one of those made one disciple in one year, that's it. Not a hundred, not something crazy, doesn't have to be a superstar. One in one year, then in year two, there would be how many? Four. And what happens the year after that? Now you can divide by anything you want. All you've done is stretch the timeline a little bit. We all know it's nothing perfect. You're not going to get 100% of anything. That's not the point. The point is it's actually practically possible. And we need to put that not just in the mind, but in the soul of each one who comes to saving faith in Jesus, that this is part of your destiny. And as you accept and embrace that, the Spirit of God is going to let you participate in his ultimate idea to get his job done. And it's right there for you. 
We're going to proclaim that. Now, the third piece of the puzzle is what we call global lift. That means innovation. Because there's a whole lot of stuff out there that's putting a very low ceiling on what I call the missionary enterprise. It's not breaking through, and it's time for that to change. Here's what it looks like. Solutions and innovation for everybody. We're going to ask experienced leaders on the ground from all around the world to engage with cohorts of people in various arenas who really know their stuff, are highly experienced and highly gifted and highly committed, and they're going to co-create solutions that are going to work for everyone. And when they get it right, we're going to give it away to anybody who is engaged in the cause of the kingdom. Here's an example here. Ever seen this? It's called the magic box. It happens to be all around the world. And there's a whole lot of people here who are trying to make this help all the people over there. The problem is they're doing it in isolation. And often what they produce isn't either understood or is not helpful. How about if we get all those people to turn all that energy towards a process of co-creating something that actually will work and run it through its 1.0, its 2.0, and when it gets right at 3.0 or whenever, get it out there for everybody. That needs to happen. And part of that is just a willingness to fundraise for failure, because that's what 1.0 and 2.0 are. But that's what it takes for everyone to get better together and have what they need. The tools need to be simple, but not simplistic. I know how to tap and swipe. I don't have any clue how this thing works. But I can make it effective because somebody who's way smarter than me worked hard enough to make sure that tapping and swiping could get the job done. We need to do that for the cause of the kingdom. The folks who are going to say it's ready are the ones who use it on the ground. There's a bunch of other illustrations. We'll save them for another time. So here's the conclusion. Where are we going? We are going wider in scope. We're going deeper in maturity. We're going higher in quality. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, we urge you in the Lord Jesus to excel still more. That affirms the good stuff you're doing, and it says keep climbing, because God is easy to please, and he's hard to satisfy. He will say to you, well done, my child, for everything you accomplished today, and he will raise the bar tomorrow. And that's the way it's supposed to be. So we need to climb with him. In this journey, we are not going to turn back, we are not going to slow down, and we are not going to stop climbing. We are going to run to win, because that's what 1 Corinthians 9 tells us to do. Our strategies are not going to be designed for the small, the limited, or the short-term impact. They will design to fulfill the promise of Romans 16.20 that says the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And as it was that Jesus is going to crush the serpent's head, he passed that mantle to us. And John 20, 21 says, as the Father sent me, I'm now sending you. And it's a flat out dogfight. And in that fight, you're going to crush Satan. And in doing that, you're going to set the captives free. Together as one great global family, united by a shared vision and values, we're going to take back the land that the enemy has stolen. We're going to restore Jesus to his rightful place as king in individuals, families, and communities. And we're going back to the beginning. where Jesus said, go everywhere and make disciples and teach them to obey everything. As it was in the beginning, it will be at the end. This is the plan that God put in place. This is the priority for every follower of Jesus. And this is the power to get the job done. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Lord, let it be. Thank you.